Hey, everybody. Captain Kyle here. Uh, I think I did it right this time. I got us live on Facebook and YouTube on the first shot, so we should be good there. Uh, believe it or not, I managed to drag Ed into yet another one uh, consecutively. That's two in a row so far. Uh, we got a good one tonight. We got Greg Sample from Pure Flats. Really cool guy. Been getting to know him here lately. Um, I've been I threw the slick lure a lot a couple years ago. Never stopped throwing it for any particular reason, but it's a it's a really good lure. And uh, he's going to talk about that. He's going to talk about um, how we acquired it. Uh, I've talked with Greg a lot. Uh, he likes to do like I do. He likes to go to other estuaries and, and fish and and figure out tactics from different estuaries and and uh, really cool stuff. We got we got some good stuff lined up. I just wanted to touch on something real quick. Um, just so y'all know, and I'll do a post about it soon in case you didn't figure it out. Um, you know, if you message us on the Facebook account or the Instagram account, it's me. It's not Chris anymore. I'm not as nice as Chris. <laughs> so just know that it's, it's me and it's not Chris. Uh, some people have said Chris, this Chris, that he's, uh, he's in the middle, you know, he's about to deploy and spending time with his family. So, uh, let's give him a break. Let's let him enjoy that family time before he heads overseas. And, um, uh, we got some more news about that later on. I, I don't know if he's some, some things we're going to share about that later on. Uh, we'll wait and make sure he wants me to uh, publish that to the world. But anyways, um, we're going to do our uh, heavy hitters webinar on uh, April 1st. Uh, me and Alex and hopefully Ed will join us. Uh, Wyatt Foster is going to come on, who is the, the leader right now. And he's going to give like, you know, a little mini seminar in, in, within that, which would be really cool. Really thankful for for Wyatt for uh, for jumping in there and, and being a part of that. And uh, we're going to pick his brain, too, man. Really, really interesting guy. Really cool kid. Uh, I've been talking with him a lot lately, too. I really like him. He's, he's the real deal. There's no doubt. As Jay Watkins would say. That's what he said. He said he's the real deal. But uh, without further ado, um, Let's uh, let's introduce our guest here, Greg Sample. And uh, Greg, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and and how you came to be with Pure Flats and, and the whole deal. Well, thank you, Kyle. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yep. Sounds good. Perfect. All right. Hey, well, first, I want to start off by thanking you guys for all the things that you do and for having me on the live stream tonight. Uh, you know, I tell you, as a as a consumer of a lot of the information you guys have put out there, uh, it's just been incredible. The network that you guys have built through the speckled truth and the, the conservation efforts that are coming out of it. Um, you know, I would say it was, I'm a little late to the game in terms of chasing the big girls. I probably is around 2018, 2019 that I kind of shifted my focus from just regular inshore fishing to, you know, trying to catch the big ones on purpose, as you say. And uh, it just, you know, listening to all the season podcast and learning so much, you know, more about, what everyone brings to this community and then combined, you know, with the tagline of, you know, keep what you need and release the rest. It's uh, it's a great body of work. And I think you guys have done an incredible job of, of creating a really cool community. So uh, thank you for doing that. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'll, I'm going to give you just like a quick summary of kind of um, how I, I came into this uh, position of, of owning Pure Flats and, and running the, the Slick Lure Company. I'll give you a little funnier, detailed version. But the, the short headline is, uh, I'm a guy in my late 50s. I uh, retired from the Coca-Cola Company after about 28 years. I, I grew up in Baton Rouge and fished mostly southeast Louisiana. Um, and so uh, I I met Joey Landrino uh, through a lot of the guides in Mobile, um, a mutual friend of ours, Patrick Garmison and Richard Rutland and Bobby Abrascato are guys that I fished with a good bit and they had introduced me to jo Joey. And uh, we had a long conversation one night in, in June of 2021 and we were able to kind of, Joey was at a stage where um, it was difficult to keep up with the way the business was scaling. He was gluing eyes on every lure and packing every bag and barcoding every bag in addition to his day job at the state of Florida. Uh, and so it just, you know, it was a, it was a great, um, it was great timing, you know, in terms of my leaving Coca-Cola, my wanting to get into the industry, Joey kind of reaching a point um, that the business could kind of start to scale a little bit. And so, we ended up making a, a transition right at the end of 2021 and, and into 2022. And, and I'll tell you a little bit more about kind of how that's transpired since then. Um, but to, to back up a little bit, um, I had um, my family shared a fishing camp with like three other families down in the Golden Meta area. Uh, we fished a lot between Fushan, Grand Isle, you know, up toward um, 
Bayou Blue and Catfish Lake and all that area. Uh, I married my high school sweetheart. Uh, my my wife's family had a camp on Grand Isle, so I uh, I got a great dose of inshore fishing. You know, since I was probably six or seven years old. Um, and then I I moved to Atlanta in the late '80s. Uh, went to work for Coke, and so I've been landlocked in Atlanta for about 35 years. Uh, and and what that meant is it it meant a lot of travel to go fish. Uh, either go back to our home camp and you know fish in the Galliano Gold Meadow area, um, or we became really good friends with Patrick Garmus and Richard Rutland and those guys, and and fished with those fellas you know quite a bit over the last uh, 10 11 years. Good, good group of guys. I like, yeah. I like Pat, man. He's my boy. And Richard Rutland, he's great too. I, I really enjoyed uh, Richard's podcast. I didn't know him too well. I knew of him, but when Chris did his podcast, I, I felt like it was a, a really good one, and it and it 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 did its job. It made me want to go fish with him. <laughs> it was a, uh, it was, it was, it was a good story, man. He's he's a cool cat for sure. He is quite the stick, and and he and Bobby have won so many of the tournaments down there. I mean. Uh, Pat will say Bobby finds them and Richard, Richard makes them eat. And uh, <laughs> it is so true. They just won this past weekend, I think, six of the last eight Battle of the Grubs, you know, which is that artificial only trout series that runs December through March. So um, hats off to those guys. They they do it well. They do. It yeah, well. I hope to get Bobby on here for a podcast next season. Uh, I haven't I've never talked to him, but. I'm definitely going to pull his arm through Patrick and, and Richard Rutland. So Patrick, if you're watching, which you better be, you should start sweetening that pie a little bit. I'd love to interview him. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be a good move. Uh, anyway. So uh, yeah, I think it was uh, late 2019. I ended up reaching out to Chris uh, and you guys, I think we're about halfway through season one on the podcast. And I just started, I, I was on a trip to Dallas and I started picking Chris's brain about, how do I up my game, you know, and, and start chasing some, some bigger fish in this Southeast Louisiana estuary. And, you know, Chris talked about moving down to saltier water and getting closer to the barrier islands. And we started doing some of that. And then, you know, combining that with some of the stuff that we were learning, you know, from Richard and Patrick and those guys. Uh, and so um, I think, you know, COVID was just setting in. It was uh, like February of 21. And I, I drove to Houston to go buy a bay boat. I found a really good deal on a used bay boat in Houston. And I'm driving there and I'm listening to y'all's podcast the whole way there. And I get to like season two, episode six and seven, and it's Joey Landerdo. And Joey's telling the story, you know, <laughs> right. of how the slick lure got started. And I'm just kind of laughing my butt off because I'm like, man, we've been fishing the slick lure for the last like five or six years, you know, with Patrick and those guys. And I love that doggone thing. It, it had, you know, kind of become my favorite lure and, and I was really throwing it all over. So about three months later, we were back down in Mobile and we pulled up to the dock and I hear this, this coon ass voice on the dock and I'm like, that's Joey Landerno. And so we all <laughs> had this VRBO house rented that night and we went there and Richard cooked a bunch of swordfish and, um, Joey and I sat on the couch for like three hours and uh, and just talked about the business. And Joey said, you know, hey, I'm, I'm running this air monitoring um, work for the state of Florida. Like I said earlier, I'm gluing all these eyes on and packaging all these bags. And, you know, I think he had gotten to about 15 or 20 retail outlets and it was just really, really getting hard for him to keep up. So, yeah. uh, like I said, we um, we worked out a. Uh, a price, a solution that was really good for him to sell the business and also a way to kind of keep him on board. I mean, Joey will always be the founder of Pure Flats. He's a great inventor. Uh, you know, if you go back and listen to those podcasts, he tells the story of how he had lost several treble hook lures in the, you know, that um, he fishes around that Keaton Beach area of Florida. And, uh, and he was trying to come up with uh, a profile that he could cast a long way that was very erratic and that he could control the depth on. And that's kind of how he arrived at, you know, well, that's how, how he arrived at the original design, you know, of the slick lure and the ability to fish it with the unweighted hook or the weighted hook. And, and that was kind of how that came to bear. So uh, anyway, uh, we went through the transition. I flew down to Gainesville, loaded up a U-Haul, moved it to Atlanta uh, in December of 21. And um, a couple of things happened. One, uh, we moved our manufacturing to a really good partner in Birmingham. Uh, we started working with Zorn Molds, uh, who's a pretty good mold manufacturer and injection molding supplier of a lot of the soft plastics equipment that get made in the United that gets made in the United States. 
Um, and the real bottleneck we had was this, this eye gluing problem. I got a, a roll eyes right here and, uh, you know, our PVC glue and there's no way to speed it up. That's yeah, no there's not. We looked, at, we looked at all kinds of ways to design the eye into the mold and try to figure out how to automate that process. And it just, it was very expensive to, you know, to produce the equipment to do it. Um, so and so what we, question, who's gluing them on? Well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to get to that. Slave right labor? <laughs> Your kids? Um, <laughs> people at, that look at like first, me? my wife and two daughters and I <laughs> and my mom were gluing eyes on lures all through Christmas 2021. And I was not, I was not very welcome in the, in the house during that period. <laughs> um, but I would have done the same thing, just so you know. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, we partnered with the Bobby Dodd Institute. Uh, they're a group in Atlanta that hires a lot of Atlanta's disabled workers. And um, they're incredible. They do all the like rubber caps that go on blood vials across doctor's offices. They do kitting for back to school and stuff like that. And so we we brought them flats of lures and eyes and kind of built a uh, an operating process. And they've been incredible. They do very fine quality work. As a matter of fact, last Thursday, they awarded us a partner of the year award. And uh, it's just been an incredible partnership with that group. We kind of further partnered with the distribution warehouse in Duluth, Georgia. And so at that point, by about, you know, mid 2022, we had manufacturing, we had a scalable way to kind of glue eyes and package product, and we had a distribution method to fulfill orders. Um, and from there, things have really grown pretty nice. I and mean, we, we, we doubled in 22. We doubled again in 23. Um, we've grown to about 90 tackle shops. Uh, we've grown from about 2,500 to 5,500 customers. And um, it's just been a blast. Um, you know, I tell you what, what I think makes the Slick Lure special is, I mean, you can cast that rascal a super long way. So you can cover a lot of water, you know, and you can keep your distance and, and kind of keep some of that stealth factor. Um, you know, the, the combination of that oval body um, with the ball tail just creates such an erratic darting bait movement. Uh, you know, it it never tends to go the same direction twice. It, it's just so darty and erratic. Um, and then third, you've got a lot of versatility. I mean, the guys in North Carolina, they love to fish it, you know, with like a four odd or three odd um, eye strike jig head. Uh, so many of the guys in Texas seems like their preferred way is the unweighted beast hook. You know, the Alabama guys and a lot of other folks, you know, tend to fish it with the weighted beast hook. Um, and so, you know, even moving down to the the Slick Junior, which we came out with in October of 22, um, you know, a lot of guys will fish out under a popping cork. I and mean, there's just a lot of different ways to fish the lure and, and make it do a lot of different things. So anyway, that that's kind of us and how we got to this point. I'd, I'd kind of close that out by saying, um, we're a big believer in, in the conservation efforts um, and certainly love participating with you guys and release over 20 and the hatcheries and CCA and the folks that are driving that. Uh, we want to see folks um, enjoy it, you know, have fun with the lures they're fishing. Um, and we want to help folks set some personal best records. And, and those are kind of the things that we try to focus on in, in, in what we're trying to do. That's um, great, man. And that's awesome that y'all are, Y'all are involved with that. And and that's, you know, I want people to really pay attention, you know, because not not every brand is not every brand is in, involved with the conservation side of things. And that's fine. You know, everybody can do whatever they want to do, but it's just a smart move on your part. You're helping protect what's what how you're making a living. Same thing with me as a as a guide. But uh, I talk a lot through these and I talk too much. And I'm going to I'm going to put Ed on the spot here because last year he called an absolute doormat with me at uh, Chandelier on the Slick Lure. But, Ed, I would love for you to uh, in case, you know, sometimes people are listening to these. They know, Greg, you got to understand there's there's people that are probably watching this that have never seen or heard of the Slick Lure. So I'm glad you showed it. If you want to show it a little more like the whole every side of it, all that stuff. But Ed, give us a little rundown on the action of that thing and, and how you like to work it in, in your preferred way. All right. So I'm going to go a different route because the Slick Lure, actually, I have some history with that. And I have some history with Kyle as well as Chris. So before I knew who Kyle was and before Chris and I really kind of started our, our friendship, um, I was using the Paul Brown Devil. So it's basically a slick profile with a treble hook and it's got, you know, um, some cork or foam inside, mm -hmm. you know, to help with buoyancy. 
And I'd been using that thing for probably two, three years, and I was just dominating the trout with it. And no one was really using it. And through the bull nettle, like I was posting, you know, some of, some of the, the catches I was getting. And Chris was like, man, this thing's working for you, yada, yada. And so um, kind of talking through how I fished and, like, how I was targeting, you know, big fish, and I felt like the profile was really great. We developed a friendship. Well, it was a boat show. And Chris was like, hey, you need to uh, talk to this guy, Kyle, yada, yada. You know, he fishes down there. And I didn't know who he was. And I, I'm, you know, I'm pretty, pretty suspicious of new fishermen because, you know, you know how we are with our spots. But <laughs> I walk up and it's Chris, it's Kyle and Troy Helwig. They're wearing black shirts because I think they're fishing a tournament at the boat show. It's like the Toys for Tots thing. They ended up winning it that year, I think, with a four pounder. Um, but I walk up and it was it was a. Uh, Ken with Egret, and I think they were selling the. Yeah, the time, I was right? working the Egret booth with Ken yeah. that year. Yeah, yeah, and so I walk up, and Ken's like, and uh, Chris had contacted Ken and said, "Hey, this guy Edward, he fishes the devil. Um, I think he would be good to kind of let you showcase that new new bait you're trying to sell." And it was it was a slick lure, and mm -hmm. so he gave me a pack of just slick lure. Well, I don't know if what they were called back then, but just blanks. So I took one, and he knew that I like to fish things weightless. So I ended up putting a 5 aught beast on it. Yeah, the glow. It was glow. The very first one was glow. It was the only color yeah, I had. That's a and killer I was like, one. All right, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. Uh, you know, because um, I'm an engineer by trade, so I like to tinker with things and try to figure things out. So I ended up going to Ship Island the next week. And, man, we had a crew that were going out. And all, everybody were really good fishermen, guys that kind of taught me how to fish, really good sticks. And, you know, that morning – I just got, I got destroyed. I'm talking everybody was catching fish except for me. I was throwing everything that I could. I was getting pissed off. Like the fish were perfect. <laughs> it was like in the spring, they were in the grass and I was throwing a mirrodine, doing whatever. And like, I mean, God's sitting next to me catching trout and I was just, I was livid. I think I almost struck out basically and everyone almost had a limit and it got to be after lunch. And I just started thinking, I was like, man, these trout are in this grass and this mirrodine just kept getting snagged. And then I, I threw the devil. The devil was getting snagged, like anything with a treble hook. And I just couldn't get it because of the way that I work. It was basically working at like a, a faster jig, like working a, a grub or a jig. You know, I was popping it instead of letting it sing, just keep popping it, pause, pop it. So I was like, I had those stupid slit lures in my, my, my shirt pocket. I pulled it out and I'd rigged them the night before with that five aught beast. And I was like, let's see what this thing's got. Tied it on there. And I didn't, I didn't know how to tie a loop knot back then. I just tied straight. Um, Threw it out there, and I'm standing. I'm telling you, we're we're surrounding this grass bed. It's probably 20 feet in diameter. We're literally circling it, and we knew something was in there. We throw in there. I pull a trout out. The guys were like, "Okay," so they're throwing stuff in. I sat there. I caught 10 trout in between all these people. I even cast next to my buddy's foot one time just to joke around, be like, "Hey, you can catch that trout next to you." Ended up <laughs> catching a trout, pulling it out, and that slick rule was tore up like. And they were like, what do you got? And they're like surrounding me. And I'm like, back the hell up now. Um, <laughs> that was, like, that was my first experience with this lure. And I was like, man, this thing's amazing. Because one, like I say, it's very aerodynamic. It's weedless. And you could work it pretty close. It sinks a little bit faster than, like, say, your suspends, like a Paul Brown or a Devil. But you can really cover 75% of the water column in four foot of water super efficiently with it. Mm -hmm. And I love a straight tail. Anyone tell you I love a straight tail? And I love the fact that things are weedless and the slick lure just covers all those profiles. And I like basically anytime a trout is in the grass and you're especially in the spring, because you got a lot of floating stuff in there. The slick lure is a great way to cover that area. And it's a great search bait. Cause like you said, I look for, I want a bait that I can cast a country mile and then I can cover water column. Right. And that has good action. And the slick lure does that. Um, so I'm a huge fan of it. Um, all he has been. And like I said, that was, gosh, that was like 2016, something like that. That was, yeah. that, that so was before that, speckle, that was before I was part of speckle truth. So it was a long time ago when, when yeah, at some yeah. point, um, Joey and Ken Shamont had something going on because yeah. Ken, for y'all that don't know, Ken, Ken owns, uh, eager baits. And that was the first company I ever got on with or whatever you want to say. Uh, and, and, did did great with them. I still still throw tons of eager baits, by the way. But um, at some point, I don't know if you know that history, Greg. But at some point, they kind of like linked up and and like 
they were selling them on the Eager Baits website. Um, Ken was pushing them really hard. So Ken was like, hey, man, you know, you got to try these. That's how I tried them right before that boat show, mm -hmm. like Ed was just talking about. Yeah, and, right. uh, man, I, I caught tons of nice trout on them. I prefer, which I see now, I see, a, Greg, do you, a lot of guys, are, are they throwing the 4 alt owner beast or 5 alt? They're throwing the 4 alt. The, yeah. the 4 alt owner beast uh, really is kind of the ideal gap. It's the ideal. That lure is about 0.48 out. Um, 0.48 ounces so it's almost half ounce and it's nearly uh you know it's nearly half an inch tall and uh and just the the hook gap on that beast hook is yeah. is just the perfect gap um you know and it's weird because um owner had a pretty severe shortage over the last 18 months up until yep. about six months ago yeah um and i ended up just researching like crazy trying all kinds of different hooks the trocar is the only other hook that i found that is the same Hook bend, yep. diameter, and size yep. is the beast. The, v, the call, VMC won't work. The yeah, VMC. but they call it a three odd. You know, like there's no standardization as as we know in some of these different swim bait hook sizes. But um, but the retaining spring is you know doesn't have that center pin spring. It's got a little bit different point. Um, it's just it's hard to match that beast in terms of having the right fit for that lure. And you know we, we almost say now the lure is kind of built around that hook, and that is the right hook. Yeah. It's the most effective hook we've found for it, you know, from a swim bait. We I like the beast. Um, yeah. I sampled with a lot of uh, different, just, just like EWGs. The trocars are nice. They were more expensive, and the beast worked just as well, in my opinion. The mm -hmm. only thing I say, if you leave the beast, or if you leave a beast hook in a tackle box, it will rust. Salt quick. water, it will rust. You got to no take down. care of them. And, mm -hmm. uh, well, but, I, um, I, Greg, I actually found, and it, it's been, you know, this is a long time ago. It's been a long time, but I found, I liked for some reason, I don't know why I'd have to tinker with it a little more. I tinker a lot. I liked the way the five alt sat on it better, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I played with both a lot because during that time, uh, Ken was selling them with either the four alt or the five alt. And, and I really liked the way the five alt sat on them. I think it was because, we were working a boat show um, or, or, or a trade show or something. I was working it with Eager at somewhere, not not in Biloxi, somewhere else. But um, I said this on another podcast, man. Ba bass guys are light years ahead of us. It, we look stupid compared to the bass guys. <laughs> but I'm working this booth, and and at this time, I'd thrown the slick lube a bunch, called a nice bunch of nice trout on it. And I'm sitting there explaining it to this guy. And, uh, and he's just kind of sitting there. Like, I, I didn't know if he was like not listening or what. He just kind of had a weird look on his face. And, uh, he was a real old country guy. And he goes, man, let me tell you a secret. <laughs> and he said, he said, if you, if you bend that hook back, if you pull it back and then you put the bait on it, he said, you'll bury that hook in the bait. And then it's truly weedless. And I was like, I, but at that time, I'd never heard of that. Yeah. And I was like, that's genius. And, and, uh -huh. and I was like, thanks, man. So everybody that came after that, I was like, look, here's a little secret now. I was like, <laughs> you got you to bury that hook in there. And then it's truly, we. and he heard me say that. He came up, man. We were dying laughing. I was like, hey, man, it was a good point. I ain't got to try it to know it's true. I was like, that's, that's hilarious. A really good point. Well, and, and that's one other area where, you know, the beast, in my opinion, beats out the trocar. trocar. That trocar has that triangular sharpened point, which is great for, you know, driving through a jawbone. But it's, when you tuck the hook, like that it'll cut the plastic you know much more quickly where the beast has that needle point that rounded mm -hmm. sharpened point and it just preserves the lure a lot longer um i was um fishing with a, a a couple of guys um down in texas in november and uh we were uh kind of down south of baffin and there was a lot of grass in the water and um you know we were tucking the hook and it just you know it got it made all the difference with the amount of grass that was around i heard a lot of feedback from the port yeah. o'connor area as well this year uh, where just the, the amount of grass, you know, was, uh, was a big driver in terms of people fishing it weedlessly. And, and then on the complete opposite side of that, you know, in North Carolina this week, and I was, you know, in the, the live stream that you did with Lowell, uh, and you guys were talking about short shank hooks, um, short shank jig heads. Um, there's a lot of guys in North Carolina that put a jig head on it. The eye strike's a good one. And even, um, this is a four odd I've got here, but a lot of guys are fishing it with a three odd shorter shank jig head. Um, and that fish hits the head of the lure and our hookup ratio testing that Monday and Tuesday was 
pretty doggone good. You know, not good for weedless, but a little more nose fall profile and you still get some side to side. So it just cracks me up how many different ways people are rigging it and fishing it. Yeah, my dad, uh, he likes to fish it a lot. And he, that's the way he prefers it is, is with a jig head. And he catches a lot of fish with it. Uh, so when I fished it a lot, um, I was fishing a lot of structure. And then I was fishing a lot of grass flats at that time. So that's another thing people need to remember is that uh, weedless baits are also great for heavy structure areas. I'm talking rocks, rubble, all that stuff. Don't, mm. don't forget that. Don't sleep on that. Whatever bait is good on the flats for a weedless application is also equally as effective in those spots that are heavy, heavy structure. And you can throw the, so I got into a real big kick for a while at one point, especially when I first started targeting big trout is I was all about big baits. Ed, you remember that I was throwing like seven foot nine rods with huge baits and like just trying to get them out there. But I, I wanted the biggest bait I could find that sank the slowest. And, and I was throwing, Corky's uh, wedge tail, five inch egret wedge tails uh, on same thing on a, on a weightless owner five alt and then the slick lure on a weightless owner five alt. And what I found um, then when I was throwing it a lot is you can do a lot of different ways you can work that lure, but you can walk the dog just, just like a top water. Mm -hmm. That lure will just boom, 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 boom. And when it's weightless, I mean, it walks really, really well. And something I found is that when you find the right water column, so you could throw it out there, you could let it fall for a minute, and then you could you could walk the dog, and it would stay in that water column, which is very important when they get very, very picky. Or, again, when you're fishing structure – and you're just keeping it right above those rocks and you're just, you're just boom, bouncing it back and forth above them rocks and was able to really fool a lot of fish where normally about the only lure I would feel confident throwing there was top water for a long time. Cause I just went through mm -hmm. so many lures, you know, it, it, it with different tides, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. You would just, you know, lose a lot of corkies, lose a lot of lures and, and it yeah. worked, it worked great with that application. But, um, you and I, Greg, we've talked a lot. Um, you were talking about, you know, especially with your job, kind of like Chris did, uh, for those of you who don't know, which you probably already do. But, you know, Chris is is, is active duty uh, Air Force and he's moved around. And that's how me and Ed met him. You know, he lived here, lived at Keesler for a while. Dude absolutely slammed big fish. And we were like, at first, we were like, wait a second, who, who the hell is this guy? You know, he's, <laughs> he's full of crap. But he's yeah. posting pictures of him. You know, this was before Facebook got big. It was on a local fishing forum. And he's posting pictures of them like on the measuring stick on the boga. And we're like, all right, he ain't lying. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. But uh, but tell us a little bit about that, about how you like going to those different estuaries and fishing those different spots and and what you pick up on there and, and what you learn in those environments. Well, I tell you, this is a this is a conversation I was very excited about having because, you know, Kyle, I've been listening to you going back and forth between Shandy and Texas, you know, just here recently. And um, but uh you know, as I said earlier, I, I've spent a lot of hours on the water in Louisiana, not a lot in Texas. I've, you know, I, I've had three trips to Texas in the last uh, 18 months or so. Um, there's a really good angler that I fish with uh, in St. Mark's, Florida, a guy named Asa Martin. I saw Asa in, on here earlier and his wife, Mallory. Uh, he's a heck of a stick. He has um, won the North Florida Fishing Club Angler of the Year several times. Um, I've been down to Punta Gorda. I fish a good bit there. I just got back from North Carolina fishing with a guy named Ricky Kellum, who's a real good pro staff guy of ours. And it just, it's fascinating to me, uh, you know, how similar in a lot of ways and how different in so many ways it is chasing these big girls, you know, across those different estuaries. Um, you know, you know, I think, uh, you know, that the, the you said it a couple of times on the last few live streams, uh, Jay talks about trout water is trout water. So true. Um, but, you know, and, and I was listening to the discussion you guys had, uh, you know, about, you know, clean water. So, you know, I've always felt like relatively clean water structure, moving water and bait, bait, bait. You know, if, if you can find those four things, you know, no matter where you are, you know, from Virginia to Texas, you know, it, those things seem to have a lot of a lot in common in terms of you know locating the right fish. 
what I noticed that seems to change so much is are the migration patterns, you know, and the spawn, you know, the spawn behavior, et cetera. Um, there's a really interesting guy that um, Patrick and Richard know well. He's on the Alabama Saltwater Fisher Report sometimes. He's a, a PhD student named Dylan Keene. And uh, he works for the uh, Dolphin Island Fish Lab in the Marine Resources, you know, with the Marine Resources Division um, in Alabama. And in a lot of their sonar tagging, uh, you know, Dylan was talking about the fact that, you know, these Dog River fish, which, you know, Dog River is a spot that a lot of these guys fish in the BOG in the wintertime, you know, and those fish go winter up in Dog River. And then they sonar track them, you know, back to Dolphin Island or back to Heron Bay. And then contrary to that, you've got these fish in Mobile River, which isn't probably five or six miles north of there. And their migration pattern tends to be on the other side of the bay, you know, down toward Fort Morgan. Yep. Um, and, you know, there's some size differences. Those Dog River fish are pretty fat fish, whereas the Fowl River fish seem to be a little more slender. You know, and Dylan was talking about the fact that those fish will make that migration, you know, in like two days, you know, and like one yep. class of fish might go in two days and then uh, they may spawn through that first, you know, full moon in May. And, and then you might get another class, you know, that kind of comes, you know, as the next wave. And so, like, you know, when you put that together and you think about some of these patterns or, or where you go, um, you know, when we're going to fish with Bobby or Richard or Patrick, you know, in the summertime, we're almost always down in the Mississippi Sound or Dolphin Island or, you know, we're down in that southern part of the estuary. And in the wintertime, we're way up north in the northern part of the estuary. And, and in Texas, it doesn't feel that way at all. You know, North Carolina feels a lot like that. You know, Monday, Tuesday, we were way up in the creeks of the Pamlico, you know, Pamlico Sound. Um, you know, and then Ricky talks about, hey, as, as I get past May and June, I'm heading down much closer to those islands. So it just, you know, I think that migration pattern to me is like the biggest difference in uh, in what I see, you know, in kind of fishing across these different estuaries. So I mean, that's my quick take on it. What's very interesting, and I just want to add a little bit to that, is um, I've been really fortunate to have a great relationship with Angelos over at the uh, research lab, our local mm -hmm. research lab. And I've, I've helped get tons of brute stock, tons of different species, all kinds of stuff. But the coolest thing, which I thought it was just absolutely mind blowing, is um, there's two things that you can do to just just two things you do to make trout spawn. It doesn't matter what their environment is. And that's water temperature and the amount of sunlight they get every day. Angelos can make trout start spawning any day, any month. It doesn't matter. All he does is slowly change the water temperature, slowly change the amount of light they're getting. He can make them spawn 10 times a year if he wants to. Mm -hmm. Which You start thinking about that and that's just, that's, that's crazy. It, it, it's just something as simple as water temperature and daylight. And, that's that's what you know when I started learning that and then the more I, I got talking with Lowell Odom and Jay Watkins and Mike Bossy and a lot of them Texas guys, which we all talk, you know, a lot. We talk a couple times a week, is is I see down at Chandelier, which I, I call it, you know, it's a totally different, different part of the world, you know, and, and I will see the same patterns. I mean, same color profile, same, you know, I'll be talking to, to, to Jay or something. And Jay's like, you know, we're, we're killing them in some dirty water on dark colors, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, I'm doing the same thing at Shandy mm -hmm. with the same color baits. And, and Jay, he, he like, I'm surprised every time. And Jay look like talks to me like I'm an idiot. He's like, Kyle, trout water, trout water. <laughs> you know, like he don't, they don't care. They don't care about the zip code. They don't care about where they're at. You know, they're going to act the same. You, you, you take them out of Texas, you bring them to Shandy. They're going to act the same. They act in Texas. They're going to find the same, you know, same type of water, same thing they like. And that's uh, that's extremely interesting, and I, I find that really cool. And even like Josh Sutton over there in uh, in North Carolina, who's been absolutely killing it since he started full time. I mean, he already was, but as a as a full time guy, you know, first starting out, guy's absolutely killing it. Great guy, and I talked with him too. See the same type of. Pattern I got a chance there. to meet Josh on Saturday. Uh, I got a chance to meet Josh on Saturday. Really enjoyed. What a that. cool dude, right? Yeah, yeah. We laughed about the ant pile and when his wife was <laughs> ants in your pants. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be that'll be a memory forever. That's that's not that's not PG rated for for this, but that was uh, that was that's a really that's a really funny story. But 
I always think that's really cool. Um, hey, everybody, I'm sorry. Uh, my little thing was kind of stuck on some comments. I, I, I was, it was kind of messing up, kind of glitching on my end. But Greg, we, we got some comments that came in when we were talking about the hooks, and it just now loaded up. So I want to go back to that if you don't mind. Um, certainly, certainly. Let's see. Here we go. We got this one. Let me go. Sorry, like the part of me, he's trying to sleep junior past fall wait list 3 0. Big trout, we're loving it. That's awesome. Here we go. Here's an interesting one. Uh, there's a better hook for those the BKK hook. Have you looked into that? We right. have. We have. Um, I, I I haven't found the right BKK with, with the right gap. I mean, um, the ones that I've seen, a lot of them have that lower spinner, I think, hanging off of it. Um, it's something I probably need to look at a little bit more. Um, but, um, I haven't really found a BKK that I'm love in love with the, you know, the owner kind of continues to, uh, kind of have my heart. Yeah. That owner beast man just has the right. So, um, Ed and I, when we were fishing a, a lot of weightless big swim baits, remember Ed, we were the only place we could find a lot of weightless, uh, hooks like that was like Dick Sporting Goods here. Like nobody really buys tackle mm -hmm. from Dick Sporting Goods here. Yeah. But they had a big surplus of owner reese hooks and VMC hooks. And the VMC just wouldn't sit right on there. Uh, you'd mm -hmm. have to get like a six alt. You're right. It, right. Yeah. And then and at that point, it's so long. It's it was so the far in the back. It, it kills that. Yeah. It yeah. Kills I tried the owner for a while with the little uh, egg, the little egg weights. Because I, I feel like I think the beast and all that I used, they would say one sixteenth, but it still felt too heavy. But the sixteenth on the owner was was a really great size, and I really enjoyed. It looks like a tiny egg almost. It's not like that long banana type yeah. of way that you see on EWGs. And the way that it sat in the water was perfect. The only problem was is the EWG on the owner wasn't wide enough because I like that's why I really like the five aught because I think it hangs down just enough to act enough of a, as a rudder when you're working it, mm -hmm. because I love action, but I don't want it to twirl in the water. Right. Yeah. And like I say, when you're using, there's a big difference when you're using a slick lure with braid and a, a leader than when you're using it with just straight mono, there's a huge difference. And if you don't try it, like do an experiment, you'll see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like when you've got that leader on braid, that, that five aught, really helps keep keep it belly down but it still lets it dart up and it'll sit like here and most of the bites that i get on slick when i'm working the grass those trout they don't they don't thump it midway they sit on that darn thing and you'll mm -hmm. go to pop it and you'll feel weight and then you set the hook you set it like your bill dance you know because that mm -hmm. ewg you want to set that thing hard right um but that's i don't know if i ever tried the four aught to be honest with you, because like I said, yeah, I, had always, the, I had the, five. the fives, man. I, yeah, I had the yeah. five and I felt like it was a it was about a quarter of an inch from the bottom of that hook to the bottom of the slick, which mm -hmm. to me gave me confidence of that hook set. Yeah, because I mm -hmm. want some space. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. if you put a hook and you can't see the bottom of the hook exposed, I just don't have the confidence. And I used the five out because I liked it with the egret wedge tail as well. I had enough space that I felt confident you get yeah. the hook set. And like I said, the trocars were great. They were sharp, but you know, one, it was too thick. The owner, I feel like the owner was just the right gauge of steel or yeah. metal, whatever they was made out of. Um, yeah. And two, you couldn't tuck it. Like I didn't that's like a, tucking that's it. A because, four, right? That's a four. Yeah, that's. You a have four. a five there. Do I don't. Five? I don't have a five with me. But that, I've written. That's an interesting comment from Saltwater Cowboy about the BKK, and I've heard a lot of people talk about that little. I don't even. Board. I've never even heard of BKK. Yeah, they're. Uh, I don't. I don't want to say they're new, but they definitely are, are coming on the scene pretty hard. I've heard a lot of talk. If they haven't them. been on clearance you, at Academy or Dicks, and I probably don't know. Mm -hmm. Can you hold that back up real quick, Greg? Sure. So if I remember correctly, which if I was more prepared, like if I was Chris Bush, I would have lures right here with me, but I'm not. I'm sorry, people. <laughs> yeah. But if I remember correctly, even when you had the screw lock all the way down on that nose. There was a little bit of a gap between that that hook. Remember, Ed, that there was a little bit of a gap between that hook and it wouldn't even touch the front of that lure. And I, I with the five ball, I, I didn't really remember it going back that much further in the bait. Like Ed was saying, I just remember there being a lot bigger of a gap at the bottom of the bait. And even sometimes 
I would I would even get a razor knife and kind of cut a, like a weedless slit in there every once in a while. I don't know if it did anything or not, but I do know that when you do that, when your lure lands, it definitely makes a different specific sound when your lure lands. When you have a soft bait and you cut a weedless slit on there and there's not normally one, this sounds crazy, but y'all can test it. And if you know, you know, but when it lands, it makes a different sound. Almost sounds like those pogies when they come up and tail slap. It makes a weirder mm -hmm. sound. It's a small difference, but I, mm -hmm. I definitely noticed that uh, with those. But uh, let's see here. We got some more here, Greg. We got some more comments. Sorry, everybody. Like I said, I, I got to gotta backtrack here because it kind of froze on me. Definitely not my fault. Just no so you worries. know. There was, there was a comment there about FTU. Um, uh Serious Tackle uh, carries our stuff near Galveston. That was one of the questions that was up earlier. <clears throat> yep, there's another one. Five K, five all. But yeah, maybe, maybe, yep. maybe get some guys to experiment with it, Greg. Yep. Uh, maybe that be yeah, maybe maybe there's a little something there. I mean, and Greg, uh, I will say, so I'm a big fan of avocado. Um, I I kind of cut my teeth on trout fishing with the deadly deadly avocado, and I think they make a the best avocado and then as a number two i would say the slick lure avocado is probably one of the sexiest because like you have the right amount of the green and kind of brown hue but it's all mm -hmm. about the red sparkle and that little slick you got one of them handy avocado, you better have one of them handy that's got to be one of your top the, producers, uh, yeah though. well is, are you talking mad slick? mullet yeah 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 see yeah. that red flake with the green like that yeah, That's perfect because it's contrast, which I love. And I think a little that glitter, I think red flake and gold flake react the same in dirty yeah. water, in my opinion. And to me, that lure will work in clean or dirty water. And if you don't believe me, challenge me because I will use that in any color, avocado all day long. Ed, you nailed it. That is our number one selling color. Yep. Uh, that and, and we've got... Uh, this croaker color does really, really well also. Yeah. And then pretty, the guys in North Carolina, they work, love this like pink. Like they, they love this pink color. Uh, oh, we yeah. sell a ton of this pink color. Yeah. And you talked about the pink. eyes. They look great to me with the eyes. But after, you know, a few trout, they come off and they still keep catching them. So... <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's like if the eyes fall off, you're Labor like, oh, alone. Man, I got to yeah, put another yeah. one on there. But you don't really need it. You could keep fishing it without the eyes. It will still yeah. catch fish. Well, Kyle, well, I wanted to ask you about the um, – I mean, do you guys see a migration pattern at all in Shandy? I mean, I know right there close to you, because I'm fishing Shell Beach. When our camp got destroyed by Hurricane Ida, and I keep my boat now in Shell Beach and Hopedale. And we you know, see a lot of migration up the ship channel and you know, up into Pontchartrain and – those inshore estuary. What what do you guys? What's different in the winter time for you and Shandy versus as you get into the spawn and into the spring? Uh, so just really the basics of trout fishing, man. The the trout are going to go where the bait is, right? So if um, during the winter, it, it, it it's it, there's different stages. Okay, so there's. Um, the, they'll get really hard on the pinfish because that's all that's there is pinfish. Mm -hmm. And then um, they get like, they, they start out on that kind of, kind of early winter because that's all there is. That, 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 that's when the fishing and Ed, you've been out there with me when they're on them pinfish. It's very tough because pinfish don't give themselves away. I've got my own little secrets. I really don't want to give away too much, uh, but there, there's ways to kind of see and find pinfish um, before you even get out of the boat. Uh, but uh, you can see them flashing in the grass, things of that nature, but they'll get on the pinfish and, um, sometimes they'll be in that dead grass on the flats on warm days, things, things like that. And then when there is a lot of mullet, uh, the mullet are transitioning to the mud anywhere there's mud there. And they are, um, you know, the mullet are, are getting the little, like the little simple pods and things like that in the mud. And so therefore the trout are moving to that mud too. Um, and I, I learned that from Jay, you know, I used to, I used to think just like everybody else, they warm to the mud because the warm, mud was warmer, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Well, they're not going to do that if the bait's not there, especially big trout. So um, just, it, it's a, it's a change in tactics, but at the same time, you know, if you get some random day that for whatever reason, there's a bunch of bait on the flats, guess what? There's going to be a bunch of trout on the flats. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's just all about, for me, 
it's it's all about just just following the bait. And that's why I love Chandelier because and, and I know this isn't gonna last forever, but um it's not as pressured as other places. So um one thing I absolutely love about Chandelier, my clients can attest for this. If it looks trouty, if it looks fishy, it is. Mm -hmm. it, it, if the water's right. If the uh, if there's bait there, if there's moving water, there's trout there. Whether they're mm -hmm. big or not, you know, it's kind of a gamble, but they're gonna be there, and that's what's cool, and, and, and that's what's great about it is I can really teach my clients a lot if that's their that's their mission is to learn more about locating trout. And you know, unfortunately, you know, controversial subject here, but. The trout fishing in Mississippi waters isn't nearly as good as it used to be, uh, in my opinion. You know, there's still trout here. I'm not going to sit here and paint a doom and gloom picture, but nothing like it used to be. It used to be like that Mississippi waters. If it looked trouty, there was trout there. Well, it can look absolutely perfect and it you won't catch anything. No, 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 nothing. So that, there are a lot of factors of that. I don't really want to get into that. But to answer your question, yeah. So I, I changed tactics uh, for me. And and that that is something, and I know I name drop him a lot, guys, but but I've, I've built a great relationship with him, and I've learned so much from him. And and Jay really fishing with Jay helped me simplify my approach. And when somebody is so good at something, they can explain it so easily that it makes these light bulbs go off in your head. And and being able to talk to Jay and pick his brain, and his knowledge is just absolutely unreal. And and, and if you've never fished with him, I'm telling you, I, I know he's booked up. You can't fish with him in Mansfield. That's like a two-year waiting list. But if you can get with him in Rockport, whatever, you will learn so much in one day. It's absolutely insane. Like, it, it really is. And he helped me really simplify trout fishing. You know, just, mm -hmm. hey, look, find the bait, find the structure, find the moving water, the trout right. are there. You know, and and it's it's funny because we we talked about you before this started, Sam Davis. <laughs> but uh, and, and I hope he pops up in here somewhere if he hasn't yet. I love Sam, man. He's hilarious. But Sam did a post a couple uh, a couple months ago, a couple years ago. I don't know if you saw it, Ed, but it's it was so true, and it, and it, it I, I felt it when he said it because it was me at one point. And and if you and if you're if you're in this trout game and and you're deep in it, you'll agree with this too. When you first started fishing for trout, you caught way more. The more knowledge you get about trout fishing, the more you start to suck <laughs> because because you start overthinking it. You you start trying to apply all these crazy tactics in these situations. Blah 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 blah. And 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 Sam Davis did a post, and it was so funny. It was like, man, I was a way better trout fisherman when I knew less about them, and, and it was so true and so spot on. But. I was at that point where I was, I was, I was picking Chris's brain all the time. I was trying to pick Jay's brain and I was just overthinking it and instead of looking at the signs, letting mother nature tell you where these fish are, whether that's the bait, whether that's birds diving, you know, and I'm not talking seagulls out in open water, big schools of trout. I'm talking about pelicans working on a flat and, and there's no pelicans anywhere else in a 20-mile mm -hmm. radius. There's some fish around there. So they're not going – the trout aren't going to be right under them pelicans, but they're going to be close to them mm -hmm. because the pelicans are feeding. And if the pelicans are feeding, the trout are feeding. And they're close to them. They're at, a you know, an ambush point close to those pelicans, and they're there. If the bait's there, they're feeding. Trout's there somewhere. At least that's how it is at Shandy. But – um, we talked a little bit earlier about tagging. I wanted to touch on that too, because I'm a huge proponent of tagging, especially here in Mississippi waters. I was one of the guys that fought really, really hard to get it back here a couple years ago. We had tagging for a while. It, it, you know, that kind of lost the funding. And then a lot of us fought really hard to get it back. And, and I was, you know, really big into it at first. And I'll admit, I'll always admit when I'm, when I'll always admit everything, but you know, I've kind of slacked on a little bit, but Ed and I, at one point, Ed, me, Ed, and Shane tagged, what was it, 47 trout in one afternoon. Remember that? Remember where that was? So we, we tagged 47 trout in one day, and we got tons of recaptures. from. I'll go ahead and say it. It, it was years ago. It was at Guffport Harbor, which is a known good trout spot. And it was during the winter, which known good mm -hmm. trout there during the winter. And 
the recapture results from those were crazy. It was the highest recapture rate I've ever gotten. And of course, a couple of them remember that like a week later, they were getting recaptured. The same thing in Gulfport Harbor, just in a different area. But then as time went on, you know, a year later, one got caught at Cat Island. Two years later, one got caught at Chandelier. Like, and that's that's 30 miles away mm -hmm. from, from, from Gulfport. And man, if you're not tagging fish, it, it's really cool. And you will learn a lot. If if you're if you've got an area figured out and, and or you think it's figured out or whatever, and your state has a tagging program, tag those fish. And it will open your eyes for when they get recaptured in a different spot. You'll be like, holy crap, those are the same fish. And they're moving to that spot during this time. And then you start putting those pieces of the puzzle together, why they're moving over there. And, and I guarantee you it's the damn bait. <laughs> but mm -hmm. but it, it's cool. It's a really cool thing to, to touch on. But um, let me see. We got some more. Uh, I don't know if I showed this one or not. Yeah. Lots of love on that BKK, yeah. man. Definitely might yeah. be something to uh, to look into there. Yeah, yep it's a it's a great lure, man. I think. Thank you, Doug. After this, oh. I'll, I guess I'll give it some more love, Greg. Uh, I've mm -hmm. got them. I just and there's no reason why I don't throw them anymore. Uh, maybe I'm kind of a little caught up in in my own thing, but it is a great lure. And, and like I said, Ed was throwing it with me last year and caught a absolute doormat flounder out at chandelier which he did not release by the way people he was not letting that big old flounder go <laughs> I, gave that away. I didn't keep that thing. <laughs> did you keep it I, I didn't keep it who kept it i don't know no you 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 kept i it. didn't bring it home i, I, I remember it. you saying this 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 hey this ain't living <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember but I do. I specifically remember. I mean, that. I, I remember. I, I remember catching a big. One. I don't know if it's not a trout. I don't really retain it to memory. Like if it's. I mean, we caught. We were catching big reds, and I caught the big flounder, but we didn't catch big trout. Fortunately, not that day. It was a tough day. But what? So you. you what about the the little slick? Are you seeing? Uh, are you seeing a difference between popularity between your little slick and your big slick in terms of? You know, <laughs> What areas seem to be using well, what I figured? I, you know, I would it, think Louisiana would be a big little slick area. It, it it has been really good in Louisiana. Um, I'm holding up the the B cat. This is actually named after Bobby. Um, the uh, it took us so much longer than we had expected to get the slick junior out. I mean, uh, you know, and I've heard that on a couple of different live streams. It seems to always take about six to nine months longer than you hope. You know, well, a lot of the, the what I'm holding here, this is the the slick junior um, with the Hayabusa uh, 16th ounce hook. And then this is the slick junior um, with the eighth ounce Gamagatsu hook. Uh, the Gamagatsu is slightly longer. The Hayabusa fits a little bit better, but it's a thinner wire hook. And like I said earlier, a lot of folks will, will rig it with just like a regular um, eighth ounce jig head. But what the junior has done for us, and I know you asked a little slick, I'm going to come back to that in a second. What the junior has done for us is, it's really given us a great downsize option with a very similar movement profile yeah. in the water. Uh, the big slick with the weightless hook sinks at about one foot per second. With the weighted hook, it's about 1.1. It doesn't change a ton with the eighth ounce weight. And the junior is probably about 1.2 feet per second. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, we've got some underwater footage on YouTube on our website and the thing just darts so well. It just looks like a little bull minnow diving, you know, yeah. through the grass and so forth. And, um, you know, I love it as like a search and destroy weapon, uh, under a popping cork. If you're, you know, just trying to find some numbers or find some fish, um, it's been very effective that way. And the, and the same thing for the little slick, we, um, we, co-hosted a tournament with the release over 20 guys um in hopedale january 20th this year and i fished with a guy named kyle devries and jonathan warham and uh and we won it on little slicks i mean it was uh i think it was 30 degrees that morning and uh the water temperature was in the low 50s and it had plummeted and those fish were just hunkered down and we found this like 13 to 15 foot canal um and we had fished the previous day and a half pre-fishing and we had really, really poor luck finding any trout, caught a bunch of big redfish. And, um, 
anyway, on Friday afternoon, Don Bayas was fish, uh, Bayless was fishing with us as well. And um, anyway, we found these fish hunkered down and it was the little slick on jig heads and the slick junior on jig heads, just real slow hopping it along the bottom. Um, and that's, you know, that's what happened in those little wintertime patterns. So whether it's wintertime and trying to go low or summertime, you know, and that water's heated up and there's a lot of competing bait in the water, that's where the junior and the little slick has really shined for us. Um, and then if we're finding a better class of fish, you know, then I'll upgrade to the bigger slick. And, um, you know, I just, I'd find that we consistently catch bigger fish, you know, with the larger lure. So yeah. are you, I'll be uh, honest, my ignorance and the fact that I haven't been fishing a lot, I didn't even know that you had juniors or so how many profiles you have? Can you show them up just in case yeah. there's other people like me? Like let's, yeah. I didn't realize so, that you had a smaller. Yeah. So we've got, we've got three models. Uh, we've got the OG slick, um, mm -hmm. which is four and three quarters. It's about a, you know, 0.48 half ounce lure. Uh, by the time you add the, if they add the weighted beast hook, you're at five eighths of an ounce. We've got the Slick Junior, uh, which is three and three quarter inches long. It's the same identical profile as the Big Slick, uh, just about 20 to 25 percent smaller. Um, and then we've got the Little Slick, which is the same length as the Big Slick, but just a much slender profile. Yeah. This guy is 0.22 ounces. The Junior is 0.24 ounces. Uh, and the, uh, the OG slick is 0.48 ounces. So, uh, those are our three, those are the three profiles that we make. So he's not running a lot of charters anymore. He's got a really gravy gig over in Texas, uh, captain in a sport fishing boat for a guy. But, uh, are you, have you talked with Michael Freeman much since you yeah, I stayed with Mike, um, last March, I went yeah. over and stayed with those guys and fished with Mike some. And, yeah. um, so, uh, yeah. Mike Freeman's a local charter captain here, and um, he does a lot of the the Biloxi Marsh um, things of that nature. They're looking for a lot of numbers, uh, but that style of fishing, and they do come across some some decent trout here and there. But um, man, I remember when they had first came when y'all had first came out with the uh, the Lil Slick. I mean, dude, he was. He was slamming numbers on that little slick. He would bite it in half, make it smaller, you know, all this stuff. And uh, he worked up. Remember, Ed? He worked that boat show when the uh, when him and Joey had the buoy, uh, the booth uh, in front yeah. of us uh, that yeah. one year. But yeah, I uh, yeah, I remember. Good. I still yeah. got the bag. Um, I saw Joey was in the comments here. I don't know if you remember Joey, but uh, y'all had that one color and you couldn't think of a name of it. And I was like, I'd call it Godzilla. <laughs> and, he, and I remember ended up seeing him like post it later on or, or on the website. It was called Godzilla. I was like, hey, he, he did like that name. But uh, I remember getting a huge bag from the, from him at the boat show and getting a bunch of those little slicks. And yeah, I've, I've done I've done very good on those as well. But let's see, Tanner's got a question for you here, Greg. In the spring and summer, what's the best way to rig, weighted or unweighted? Depends on where you're fishing, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, gosh, you know, what depth are we trying to get to? Um, so, you know, I, uh, I mean, high in the water column in real shallow water, I'm, you know, almost always going unweighted. Um, you know, I was talking to Patrick a couple of weeks ago, and that was all he could get him to hit on was the unweighted. Um, yeah. And, you know, you can fish it deeper with the unweighted. You just got to be a little patient, you know, and and let it get down there. Um, but if, uh, you know, you if one to four foot, yeah. one to four foot unweighted. Yeah, no doubt. I would definitely agree with that. Any, anytime. I don't want to misspeak here, but um, I would say more consistently. Uh, no matter how fired up they are, um, if I can throw, and this is specifically for bigger trout, by the way, if I can throw a bigger profile that sinks slower, I'm going to catch more numbers of big trout. Um, and the very few times that, I mean, like I said, I don't want to, I don't want to get too deep into it because there's so many different variables, but um, more consistently in that depth water, um, bigger profile that sinks slower, you're going to catch bigger trout for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, definitely for me. Um, let's see here. There we go. Yep. Reds do yep. love them. I would imagine that. 
Oh, did we lose him? Uh oh. Did we lose him, Ed? We lost our host. We might have lost him. We'll see <laughs> and get him to come back. But I will say, well, I remember when when the little slick came out and like I was fishing a lot then. I'd get a lot of questions. People were like, man, you know, I'm kind of new to fishing. You know, I'd like to catch big fish, but I really just want to go out and catch fish in general. Mm -hmm. and there's a few paddle tails out there. You kind of give them out that was foolproof, but there really wasn't like a straight tail that was out there. That right. you could, besides like the deadly Dudley was pretty good. Mm -hmm. But when that little slick came out, it'd be like, put that little slick on an eight ounce jig head and throw it out there and do like, be like, how do you work it? Be like, how do you not work it? There's no way to mess it up really. Yeah. Like, I mean, if, like, if you want to drag it, sometimes that works. But, like, just mm -hmm. get your rod to get a little action <laughs> yeah. and just – and hold on. Cause Way to save the day, Ed. I was I was clicking on a yeah. comment, and then everything disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> I was really – I checked my phone real quick, and I saw you all still talking. I was like, that's my boy, Ed, saving the day. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Uh, like I said, I, I'm new to this. I'm, I'm trying to – trying to keep it going here, but I, I went to click on a comment. I don't know what happened. I don't know. It, it kicked yeah. me out for some reason, but we're still here. That's a good deal. Um, let's see. So the hook in the package was a four alt, right, Joey? No, uh, Donna. I think I remember when they were selling it with the, with the hook. Uh, I, uh, you remember that? Ed? You remember I'm when you would pretty sure it was a four alt. I'm pretty That's sure. Okay. I'm pretty Thank sure you. it was the four alt. I mean, when, when Joey fine. and I did the transition, he was, he was buying owner four odd beast hoods in bulk and he was putting them in the package. And as a matter of fact, there were a couple of packages still at Westican outdoors that had some, had some hooks still in them, but yeah, I'm pretty sure Don, it was the four odd owner beast. Yeah. I was just in a uh, gore and flows bait and tackle uh, the other day and uh, they had a ton of owner four alt and five alt eight ounce hooks. And I said, Danny, you need to post that you have these. And he said, why? I said, you know how hard these are to find yeah. right now? Yeah. He's like, man, they've been sitting on my shelf forever. And I was like, put a dang post on Facebook and say you yeah. have these. Like, they are so hard to find. Yeah. That, that's I, I, why people, that's a good yeah. example, why you always stop by those local bait shops. Because sometimes they have things that have been sitting on a shelf for a while. And it's something that nobody else has because nobody's going there to buy it. But yeah, they got, they got yeah. a bunch of four alt and five alt eighth ounce hooks, yeah. and those are hard to find right now. I'll, I'll tell you another funny story. Um, that guy that I was mentioning earlier, Dylan Keene, um, you know, one of his favorite colors is this one we call BC Money. And he fishes a lot with a guy named Matt Swiggum, uh, who, uh, who has a charter business, you know, over near Gulf Shores. And, uh, and those rascals, they'll take these spike it uh, markers and, uh, yep. and go to coloring on slick lure. Yep. So, you know, this was, this was dirty ice, you know, and, and basically with those spike at markers, there's a lot of things you could do. And, uh, and Matt caught him a dirty 30, um, you know, in his home waters on a colored slick lure, um, I think mid last year. So a lot of, we've got 20 colors of the big slick. We've got 14 colors of the junior and, and nine of the little slick. We've got four new colors that were, that are coming out in about three months, three to four months. Um, but it just shocks me how innovative folks are, are being. And, you know, uh, Asa Martin's another one that will take those spike it markers out and put dots on them and make them look like a baby trout. And um, there's a lot of creativity going on out there. I'll tell you a funny story about that spike it marker. <laughs> is so, it about Shane? Is it Shane? No, it's Troy. Oh. Uh, so Troy Helley and I, we used to fish a lot of tournaments and a lot of tournaments here, you know, it's a lot different than what y'all are used to for sure uh, in other states, especially like Texas and stuff. But our tournaments would be, you know, two, three days long. They would start at midnight on a Friday or something like that. And I got into that spike at craze for sure. I was coloring lures. And for those of you that don't know, it's also garlic scented and it's extremely strong smell of garlic. Horrible. Horrible. So, uh, and, and, and for those of you who also don't know is me and Troy like to party and we like to have a good time. So, uh, if we're out fishing a tournament, we're having a good time, right? And so uh, I told Troy, I said, man, I said, one day 
I'm going to get somebody. They're going to get too drunk. They're going to pass out, whatever. I'm going to draw a mustache on their face with a spike it pen, and they're going to smell garlic, and they're not even going to know, and they're going to have a mustache. So Troy and I would be fishing these tournaments after I said that, and we'd be looking at each other. It'd be one or two in the morning. One of us would be dozing off, and we both had spike it pens in our pocket just waiting for one of us to doze off to do that, and it never happened. So if you ever want to get somebody, get you one of them spike it pens, wait till they doze off, and draw a little mustache not only will they have a, a a chartreuse mustache but they'll have the strongest smell of garlic they've ever smelled in their life <laughs> hilarious hilarious no doubt <laughs> <laughs> we've all been there true. dude yeah yes. everybody experiments here yep yeah very true very true Look at that. There's his rebuttal. They patch and gig. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. They <laughs> That's catch right. Girls. That's right. All right, man. Well, we are at that hour mark. Uh, look, I appreciate everybody tuning in. And uh, Ed, thank you for for coming in on this and helping me out. And um, and Greg, man, I can't thank you enough for being a, a big supporter of Speckled Truth and supporting conservation in general, man. That's that's what, that's what all brought us together. And really cool that that is something that brings us together. For those of you who you know, are kind of on the edge of it or whatever. I can tell you right now, going down that road of conservation and 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 supporting it will open more doors for you than you could possibly imagine. But, um, Greg, you. I appreciate you. I appreciate everything. Uh, is there any any last words before we sign off here? Uh, no. Any, I, wait, I, any uh any new colors? Anything like that? Any new stuff you want to tell yeah, anybody? Yeah, I um I I. Going to be a little quiet about what exactly they are. We're um, we've got four new colors. We've got two new slick colors, uh, one junior and one little slick that should be out. We'll make an announcement in probably the next forty-five to sixty days. But but I've been saying that for the last forty-five to sixty days, and uh, we're a little bit delayed getting some things out of manufacturing. So um, but um, yeah, we'll announce that. So we, and then. You know, there's a couple of colors that we've sunsetted um, and, and you always get some grief when that happens. But, you know, we've got a you know, we're thinking about maybe doing some limited runs if there's if there's some ones that are really, really in high demand. Um, but, yeah, so we'll have four new ones coming out. We're not not immediately planning on any new models. You know, I, I was going to say that, um, you know, we're a small company. We um, we are not trying to go, you know we want to be very careful in how quickly we grow. We're not trying to get in a bunch of big box stores. We much prefer to partner with mom and pop shops and, you know, of course awesome. online is a good way to go too. But, um, but anyway, uh, we're going to be cautious about it. And, um, you know, if we've got enough anglers that have really shown, you know, a good color we need to come out with, we'll strongly consider it. No doubt. I want to address this real quick. Laz, if you, uh, uh, Greg just took over, uh, what, what year did you take over pure flats by the way? It was right at the end of 21, so beginning yeah. of 2022. Yeah. So Joey Landrino started it, and and we interviewed him on season one. Was it season one, right, Ed? It was season two, episode season two? six and seven. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Season two. Uh, uh, and it Joey came, Landrino explained all question, I think Joey was saying it came from the extras that they yeah. got from the devil from, I forgot what site, Bad Lures or something like that. Yeah. And it was just off um, – it was basically lures that had something wrong with them. I don't know. Yeah. What well, here, here's the thing. For. So I've, I've actually gotten my hands on uh, those Corky devil uh, blanks. And I'm going to tell you right now, Joey did a phenomenal job um, adjusting that mold or that yes. size or whatever. They sank way you, faster. You fit I on a big some head of or, uh, or a swim bait hook. So if you get your hands on, um, on just a blank corky devil that doesn't have a hook on it, I can promise you there is no jig head or no swim bait hook that's going to fit well on it. So that's what Joey did is he, he made yeah, it, he, he made that a thing because, uh, mm -hmm. and he, he explains all that in the podcast. So if you want to give that a listen, it's a good listen. And Joey's a, Joey's a great guy. He's been a supporter of, of speckled truth from the beginning. That's great to see that, uh, you know, Greg took over and, and, and followed in his footsteps as well, yeah. supporting us and, and being there for us. B very strong innovator, still a great partner. And um, yeah, we, as a matter of fact, we worked the show together this past uh, Saturday. So he's a, uh, he's a yeah. great friend and a good partner will always be the founder and hopefully we'll get some more innovation out of him as we move forward. 
Awesome. Well, good deal. Well, look, I appreciate everybody tuning in. I appreciate all the comments. Like I said, uh, I'm going to do a post about it soon. Uh, maybe next couple of days, um, I'm, I'll be at Chandelier the next four days. So I, I'm going to be running hot and heavy. So I won't be posting much on the Speckled Truth uh, site. Maybe if I, you know, if I've got the energy whenever I, whenever I get in. But um, like I said, we're going to do our heavy hitters webinar on April 1st. We're sending out those emails soon. Um, if you're part of the program, you'll get an email because we got your email, all that stuff. So tune into that and and pick Wyatt Foster's brain, who's leading it right now. He's going to give us a little tidbit on on something specific. He hasn't really told us yet, but uh, something he likes to do technical with with targeting big trout should be uh, should be really good time. But thanks again, Greg, Greg. And thanks, Ed. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Ed. Take care, everyone. Thanks.